um, this first uh, meet and greet of the uh, of the cognitive science uh, program uh, for 2022. Uh, and um, thank you for, for attending. I'm Dave Karina. I'm a professor in linguistics and faculty at the Center for Mind and Brain. I'm serving as the chair of the undergraduate program in cognitive science, and I, it's been an honor to serve in this role. Uh, as you may know, this has been a highly successful major, and in a little more than six years, we've grown to over 600 uh, majors. Uh, which is a, a phenomenal uh, growth. Um, and it's it's really the broad interests and engagement and excellence of you guys, the students in this major that have brought such notoriety to the cognitive science major here on campus. And we're really excited to, uh, uh, um, uh, to continue this growth and garner further uh, recognition and support from the administration and the many colleges that help provide a curricular um, a curriculum for um, our, 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 our major. Um, as I mentioned, we were originally had planned to do this as an in-person meeting and, and uh, unfortunately, obviously, we've had a switch to Zoom, uh, but perhaps in spring quarter, we will have a, an opportunity to meet face to face. Uh, and so stay tuned for uh, information about that. Um, I have very, uh, uh, just, a, uh, just a couple, one little exciting bit of news that I would like to share with you, and, and you'll hear more about this going forward. Uh, but we've recently, and this, this will be a special interest to cognitive science uh, seniors, um, we've recently received a, a very generous uh, gift from a cognitive scientist and, and a fellow professor from UC Berkeley, Robert Glushko, who has um, gifted us um, uh, some monies to establish um, a, a, a se uh, an award for a senior or up to three seniors uh, in cognitive science uh, who have shown outstanding uh, progress and involvement in the program. And, and the, the, the amazing thing is, uh, aside from just the kind of honor of, of getting the Glushko Prize, it all actually comes with a cash award of $500. So really some nice incentive uh, to continue to be uh, a participating member of cognitive science uh, here at UC Davis. And we'll, we'll, we'll have more to say about the, the Glushko Award uh, in future um, communications. Uh, I'm very happy to see several of our faculty members who serve on the program committee here. The program committee, there's about seven of us and uh, representing many uh, of the departments uh, that, that, that participate in the program. So uh, Richard Husky's here, I see Steve Luck, uh, Zoe Drayson, uh, Jakin Dietrich. Um, who else am I missing anybody? Um, those are the people I can see on my screen. Oh, and Kenji, of course. Uh, yes. Um, um, and again, I, I have my thanks to you guys for attending and being such a, a, an important part of, the, of this major. I'm also really excited to see many members of the Yellow Cluster Advising Team. Um, these are the folks who are really kind of at the front line and helping you guys as students navigate through this, you know, at times very complex and somewhat changing uh, program. And so, um, I'm first going to turn it over to um, uh, Melina Jelis uh, Doherty, who's going to introduce her team and have them say a few words. Uh, after that, it'll come back to me, uh, and I would like to introduce um, uh, Amy Lee and Ma uh, Mati Akana, who are a couple of undergraduates uh, that, I, that want to share some information um, as well. So uh, I'll let go ahead, take it away, Melina. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks, Dave, for that introduction. My name is Melina. I'm the undergraduate programs manager for the Yellow Cluster, which includes psychology, cognitive science, um, philosophy, and science and technology studies. Um, I'm here today with my little co-worker <laughs> from the home office. <laughs> so if you see a, a head floating in the virtual forest, that's <laughs> what's going on. Um, but yeah, very happy to get to be here with you all tonight. Um, we have some of our staff advisors and some of our peer advisors here joining us. Um, so our staff advisors are really fabulous at, um, you know, helping to come up with your degree plans as you're figuring out like, okay, which classes have I taken? Which ones do I still need? Am I on track to graduate? Uh, once you're at the point of filing to graduate, our staff advisors are the ones who approve your 
major requirements for graduation, which is always very exciting. Um, we're the ones that if you transferred into Davis, you probably uh, will be meeting with this quarter and would have met with us over the summer. Um, and then our peer advisors are a wonderful resource as well. Um, they're not the ones that are clicking approve on your degree worksheets uh, or your, um, your graduation requirements, but they have um, what is really invaluable experience in our classes and in our major. Um, they have really that first person um, perspective and wisdom um, and are a great resources, resource as you're trying to pick your classes and figure out you know, how to match the courses you're taking with your interests. Um, so we offer a drop-in advising uh, every day of the week. So you don't need an appointment. You can come to drop-in advising. Um, and then you can also schedule an appointment if you'd like with our staff advisors. So that's a little bit about our advising team. We've got a few folks who couldn't make it tonight, um, but I'd like to hand it over to our folks who are here to introduce themselves. And Keely and Jenna, do you wanna introduce yourselves first and then we'll switch to our staff advisors? Yeah, sure, I can go first. Hi everyone, my name is Keely. I'm one of the peer advisors for Cognitive Science and I'm super excited to be here and see you all today. And hello, I'm Jenna. I'm also a peer advisor and I am a third year cognitive science and psychology double major. Thank you both for being here. And then Alyssa and Jillian, would you like to introduce yourselves next? Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Alyssa McGorian. I use she, her, hers pronouns. Um, it's great to see you all. Hello, I'm Jillian. I'm another one of the staff advisors. And I'll give it to Dave. Thank you all. Thank you all. Um, would uh, well, just spontaneously, why don't I have uh, uh, the the faculty uh, program advisor folks uh, just introduce yourself? Uh, we'll hear from Kenji in a moment. Richard, do you want to say uh, hello? Uh, yeah, sure. Hi everyone. Uh, I'm Richard Husky. I'm a professor, or assistant professor in the Department of Communication here at UC Davis. Glad to be here. Great, uh, Steve. Hey everybody, I'm Steve Luck from Department of Psychology and Center for Mind and Brain. Great, and Zoe. Thank you, I'm Zoe Drayson. I'm in the Department of Philosophy. And today I had all kinds of really, really awful spreadsheet sort of based chores that I had to do for <laughs> philosophy things to do with graduate admissions and so on. And what made my day is that I had two separate meetings with COGSI majors today about different things. And uh, yeah, way, way more fun than anything else I'm doing. Always a breath of fresh air. Thank you. Yes. The majors as well as Zoe. Um, uh, <laughs> Jochen, tell us, say, say hello. Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Jochen Dittrich. I'm a professor in the Department of Neurobiology, Physiology and Behavior and a member of the Centers for Neuroscience and Neuroengineering and Medicine. Thank you all. And I, I, I just want to point out that, you know, this program committee kind of represents many of the different departments that are involved in the colleges that are involved. And it's really what makes us um, be successful and nimble uh, in, in navigating this program. Next, I'd like to turn over to Amy Lee and Mithri Khanna, who um, are, are two undergraduates who approached us this year about with an interest of kind of reconstituting and reinvigorating a cognitive science club. And so I'm going to turn it over to them and have them tell you a little bit about their ideas uh, and, and how you might get involved uh, in, in, in a cognitive science club. So, Thanks for that introduction, David. Yes. Hi, everyone. Um, just to start off with, my name is Mithri, and I'm a second year cognitive science major, and I'm your minoring in neuroscience. Hello, I'm Amy. I'm a second year um, cognitive science and design major, and we're hoping to reopen the cognitive science club for spring quarter 2022. Um, as cognitive science students ourselves, uh, we felt the need of a community where students can gather and share their di diverse experiences in the field. Yeah, um, through the cognitive science club, we kind of hope to meet this need by introducing the field of cognitive science and what it means to be involved in the major. Um, by discussing the different fields and career paths that cognitive science students can take through hands-on learning workshops, uh, discussions, projects, and more. And with the club, we also hope to connect members to alumni, faculty, and professionals in the cognitive science field through guest speakers and panel events like the one that the COGSI committee is hosting here today. 
Yeah, so if you want to join us, uh, we are recruiting officers um, to help us reopen the Cognitive Science Club. Um, so we will link the application link in the chat if you're interested. Yeah, so if you're interested in joining us um, as a member or an officer, or you just want to stay updated about the club, you can also find us on Instagram at CSSA at UC Davis. Um, and again, we'll link all of these in the chat. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you guys. It looks like we have a question uh, from Stace. Yeah, if you don't mind, I'd like to ask a quick question. Um, would these officers be for the upcoming school year or just for the spring quarter? I, uh, Amy and, and, and Mitri? Yes, uh, so it would just be for the spring quarter as we are just planning to open for the spring quarter. And then officers for the next school year will be determined um, during spring quarter. Excellent. Well, thank you. And again, I think that's another uh, an exciting opportunity. And I appreciate the, the kind of the ground up effort uh, to get this the, the program or the, the club back up, uh, up and running. Um, we've had it in the past and, and I know people have gotten a lot out of it. So um, let me just now quickly turn over to our main speaker tonight. Uh, so it's my honor to introduce Dr. Kenji Tsugay, who's a professor in our Department of Linguists. Uh, ling linguistics and, and Kenji is a computational linguist uh, and also, as we mentioned, a member of the CGS program committee. Uh, he has brought, um, you know, a new excitement to our curriculum. Um, he has been a, a, a dedicated supporter of, of cognitive science. Uh, Kenji received his BS from uh, UCLA in computer science with a linguistics major uh, and then went on uh, to earn a PhD at Carnegie Mellon, uh, the School of Computer Science Language and Technologies Institute. Um, he's held many, uh, he's, he's held positions in industry as well as academia, so he's a great resource for people who are interested in trying to navigate um, career paths going forward who might have interest, especially in computational linguists and related fields. Um, he has a wide ranging, uh, a wide range of interests. And I just wanted to point out or just give you titles of a couple of his current exciting projects. So he has projects that are looking at neural models of sentence meaning and similarity for authoring specialized content and domain specific interactive language systems. I believe that's an NSF grant. He has. He's looking at data-driven cross-linguistic modeling of word order preferences, empirical analysis of second language acquisition, modeling human, uh, human communication dynamics, and he has a, a long-standing interest in, in child language as well. Um, so today uh, we've asked him, and he's been generous to offer a presentation on a provocative work called uh, Polyglot Machines, a new universal grammar for artificial intelligence. And that's a question. Um, so we'll, we'll turn it over to uh, Kenji and, and, and thank you. Thank you, thank you for uh, the very generous uh, introduction. Yeah, so let me uh, share my screen here so you can see some slides. Um, the, uh, the title is very intentionally uh, clickbait. I was planning to make this much more blasphemous than what you're going to see because I found out this is gonna be recorded. So I'll try to keep things uh, uh, safe for, for public consumption. Uh, let's see, here we go. Yeah, universal grammar. Uh, not that universal grammar as, as we're gonna see. So uh, in this uh, talk, I'm gonna say uh, something about uh, neural language models. Oh, before I, I do that, I should point out that what I'm gonna talk about is uh, joint work with my students. Uh, tai Chi was actually a cognitive science uh, undergrad here at UC Davis. He graduated a couple of years ago. He was a, a, a cognitive science major, like uh, most of you, when uh, he, uh, he did some of this work that you're going to see. And some of this work is also a joint work with my PhD student, Dion. Uh, I'm going to say a lot of things about neural language models. And when I say neural, you might be thinking brains, but that's not what this is going to be about. By neural language model, what I really mean is pretty much this, a little neural network, artificial neural network, not brain. So anytime I say a neural, I'm talking about uh, that type of thing, the, the artificial neural network. 
And then I brought up this universal grammar. Uh, like I said, very intentionally uh, clickbait, uh, because when the other people hear universal grammar, they will think of the work of Noam Chomsky. And uh, there's very, very specific meaning associated with universal grammar. And that's not what I'm gonna talk about. What I'm gonna talk about by universal grammar, what I mean is this, a little uh, neural network again. And we're gonna see uh, uh, why, uh, you know, we could also call this uh, a universal grammar of sorts. Uh, now, there's been a lot of progress in computational linguistics, natural language processing, anything having to do with uh, machines uh, dealing with human language uh, in the past, uh, I wanna say things really started heating up in the past 10 years, uh, but as, uh, as much progress as we were making in natural language processing computational linguistics, most of the language technology that we have is still focused primarily on English and sometimes a handful of other languages. Like you see here a little picture of the uh, Echo device from Amazon, right, in the Alexa platform. I think it supports eight languages. It's like English, uh, French, Japanese, Hindi. So it's a, a very, very small number of languages, especially considering that, you know, what you see here on the slide, that's not even different languages. That's different language families. That's just the language families. And each one of these has lots of languages in it. And one of the things that linguists do is study the relationships between these languages and uh, organize them and figure out how everything relates to each other. And part of what we're gonna be talking about here is how a machine can figure this out. And it will figure it out just by looking at text, just by looking at text that appears uh, on the internet, looking at text character after character, and we'll see if we can figure out what the grammar of these languages is like. And when I say grammar, I don't mean, uh, you know, some rule that says uh, don't end a sentence with a preposition or use whom if it's a, a, an object and who if it's a, I don't mean that type of grammar. I don't mean explicit rules. I mean uh, something that we all have internally that tells us that when we see a sentence like we ate hot sandwiches, we say, yeah, that looks like English and it sounds good. But if we say uh, sandwiches ate hot, we, say, well, those are words in the English language, but that does not seem like a sentence that anybody would say. So we know the grammar of the language. So we know that the first one looks good and the other one doesn't. So linguists sometimes try to kind of explain what's going on and formalize and they try to map out the structure of these sentences in a way that you know, increases our understanding of what's going on. Those of you who took Linguistics one or uh, Linguistics 103b will have seen diagrams like this when people try to represent the syntax, the structure that the sentences have when you start combining words to form sentences. I'm gonna talk a little bit about sentence structure and syntactic structure, but I'm not gonna use this type of diagram. The one that I'm going to assume actually looks like this. There is actually a very close relationship between uh, uh, these two types of diagrams. This one is used a little more frequently in computational linguistics now. It just shows that you have a main verb in that sentence. You have a, the subject, we to one side, you have an object, sandwiches, and that object has a modifier. It's hot sandwiches, not just sandwiches. And if we're talking about English from that diagram, you can tell right away that you have you know, the verb in the middle and the subject and object to, to either side. You have an adjective there, hot, that's modifying sandwiches and that's before the noun. And that's you know, the kind of the rough configuration of things uh, in English. If I were to say the same thing in Portuguese, you would still have the subject verb object order, but then you would have the adjective after the noun. And if you were saying this in Japanese, Japanese, you would have the verb come at the end. So these, uh, by knowing the grammar of these languages, you could draw these, uh, these little diagrams. And this, like I'm saying, it's meant to like, represent the uh, grammatical analysis, the grammatical relationships 
other words in, in these uh, sentences. Now, I'm going to talk about how machines uh, can do this. If machines can acquire the grammar to a sufficient extent, then you could analyze sentences this way. And I'm going to use, like I said, the neural language model, which is kind of the workhorse of much of computational linguistics in the past few years. First, before we start talking about uh, multilingual models and polyglot models, I am going to show you a very simple neural language model. So this is not going to be super technical and it's not gonna be at the level of detail and precision that you, know, you could just learn how to implement these things and go and write a program and have one of these things running. I'm gonna give you kind of more or less you know, the, the workings of these things just so you can get an idea of how these machines work. So to build a neural language model, the first thing you need is lots and lots and lots of text. You can get text from Wikipedia. Many people do. You get lots and lots and lots of text. Here's English text. I just copy and pasted this from, uh, from Wikipedia. Now, what the language model uh, does is a very, very simple task. This is what we build this model to do. I'm gonna take a, you know, a segment of that text and what the language model will try to do is fill in the next word. Given some words, give me the next word. Guess what comes next? I received an MA in speech science and a, so what comes next? Like as uh, speakers of English who are familiar with the uh, different types of degrees, many of you might have guessed that what's coming up next is PhD. And then we, you know, we keep asking the language model, this machine, right? What comes after this? And it's in. As speakers of English and knowing that these degrees, you know, are in certain disciplines, you might have guessed that too. And then you have to guess what this is going to, to, to be in. It could be anything. Like it would make sense for, for this to be uh, like, um, you know, French. It would make sense for this to be chemical engineering, but knowing something about the world, we would guess that this is going to have something to do with language, right? So maybe it's linguistics, maybe it's cognitive science. It turns out to be, in this case, it's psycholinguistics. But, you know, we would have like some expectation and some rankings because of our knowledge of language and our knowledge of the world. What we ask of the language model is try to guess these words. And how does it guess these words? A good language model will be very good at guessing these. How does it do it? And why is it called the neural language model? Well, this is a little neural network. And I will tell you how it works very, very briefly. You have input coming in on one side, and you have output that's gonna appear on the other side. In this very simple language model, the input is gonna be some word, some preceding word, and the output is going to be the next word. It's going to be the guess, right? So here I just, you know, put some words on the, on the slide, but, you know, all of the words that the model knows uh, in English would be there as possible outputs. And what's going to happen is here on, on these inputs, let me uh, get a pen here. Right here we have uh, inputs you're gonna get some values coming in, right? And I put some values in there. And then each of these lines that's connecting these little circles that I'm gonna call units, these are supposed to be the neurons, the artificial neurons, right? What's happening here is that there is a value of you know, 0 0.2 here, and then there's some weight associated with this, uh, with this connection between this neuron and this neuron. And that value is going to be multiplied by that weight and it's going to get here. Then there is some function that gets applied to it. And then same thing happened here. And all of the lines that are going into each one of these circles are adding more and more activation. Adding, we're adding those numbers into those neurons, right? And then in the end, whatever has the highest sum here is going to be the guess. It's going to be what the model guessed, right? So here's the thing, where did these numbers come from? Well, for now, let's say that I found some 
wonderful magical way to map English words into these numbers, into you know, some set of numbers, it's actually a vector. And that vector is pointing to several points in space. And let's also accept for now that this space has been arranged in some wonderful way so that the words that are similar are together in this space. So all of the uh, names of cities will be over here and all of the uh, you know, descriptions of feelings will be over here and body parts will be over here. Somehow we managed to create this space where all the words are arranged in a way that's meaningful and that's gonna allow this neural network to, uh, to do you know, what it does, right? Now, I don't have those, uh, those, those vectors. I don't have those mappings. So instead of doing this, Let's just have one of these uh, input neurons for every word that we know of, and then we'll connect them like this in another layer of this network. And then this is how the network learns how to make the, the prediction for what the word is next. We get all the text that we have, right? And then we say, if we see the word the in the text, in the text, maybe after the word the, we had the word dog. So first we tell the network, okay, predict what the next word is if I say the word the. The network doesn't know anything. These numbers are all random when I start. It's all random. So it's gonna select something, something ridiculous. And then you say, no, it was not that. It was the word dog that I wanted. And then I'm gonna, adjust all of these connections from dog all the way to the, all of these lines, I'm gonna adjust the numbers. So the next time I see the word the, I'm gonna be more likely to choose the word dog. And I keep doing this for millions and millions and millions of words. Then I see the word dog, right, was the next word. Then I wanna see the word on. And if I don't see the word on, I adjust everything, all the connections to make it more likely that I see the word on and so on. It turns out that if you do this for long enough, something amazing happens, okay? So over here, where those numbers are coming in, the incoming connections from the words to these neurons right here end up being precisely that magical arrangement of words so that they are arranged according to usage and meaning and relationships and then in, it was around 2013, I think that people kind of rediscovered this magic and then people started analyzing what that space is like. And they figured out that it was not that words that were similar to each other were together. There were also spatial relationships that were describing the spatial, the, the relationships of things in the world. And it was things like uh, verb tenses. And so there were things that were about language and the syntactic relationships. And there were other relationships like, you know, country, capitals, and uh, many other relationships. All of these are spatial relationships in this space, you know, kind of made sense. That, uh, you know, started a huge revolution in natural language processing computational linguistics. Now, let me tell you how this model gets better. Remember that here, we're just looking at pairs of words, the word and then the word that comes next. Well, we can do a little better than that. We can do sequences, not just the word and then the word that comes next, but now we can actually connect the previous prediction that I, that I had to the next one that I'm gonna make so if I have the word the coming in and I'm gonna, and then I say, oh, the next word is dog. Then I say, okay, so the next word is gonna be dog. So that's gonna be the word coming in. But now instead of choosing the next word just based on dog, I also get this information that I had from before. So now it knows that it's choosing based on dog, but that before dog, there was the. And then once he chooses on, 
and that becomes the next one that's going to be, you know, the, the next previous word, right? But now it doesn't just know that the previous word is on, it also knows whatever was here. And here, I had some knowledge that the previous word was dog, and the one before that was the. So it's keeping all of those things uh, in these uh, states right here to make the prediction of the next word based on whatever it needs from the previous, uh, from the previous words, right? Now, when you do this, then you can take much longer context into account. So this is kind of the simplest type of uh, recurring neural language model. Now, the language models that I'm going to talk about next, they are more complicated than this. Uh, in particular, the, uh, the one I'm going to show some examples of is a language model called the transformer that works a little bit differently from this. But this is the basic idea for how you would predict next words based on uh, previous words using neural networks. Oh, by the way, if you have questions, uh, you, can, uh, you can feel free to uh, ask me during the, uh, the talk. You don't have to wait until the end. I'll have the, uh, the chat open here in case somebody throws something on the chat. Now, let me show you an example of what one of these neural language models can do. If you build one of these, if you estimate all of these connections using you know, a lot of text, you know, all of Wikipedia plus a whole bunch of text, it's, you know, text that comes from the web. It's all kinds of text. It's a lot of stuff. Now, remember that back when we were talking about even that very simple model, let me pull it up here. I said, as it learns, in order to predict what the next word is going to be, it just doesn't learn how, you know, what word categories com come with what other word categories. It also learned the relationships between things to make its predictions about what comes next even more precise, right? So a model that has much more context like this one and is trained with a whole lot of text, much, much more text than any person will see in an entire lifetime, starts to learn a whole lot about language and a whole lot about the world just to make that prediction of what word comes next. So here is a, uh, a little something that I typed. So you're going to see in bold face what I typed using my keyboard. And then, and then I press a button and the language model types the rest. And I took a little video of it. You can see uh, what, uh, what happens here. Let's see. I just typed this uh, today. Hope it's legible over there. And there, everything that you see coming out there that's just the model coming up with that by itself on the fly. So a lot of people ask, I mean, do these language models, can these machines really learn the grammar of a language? Can, they, can these models learn the syntax of a language? And I say, uh, you know, the answer to that is obvious. If you look at what it writes, it is English. It's coherent English. And in order to write coherent English, English the model must know the grammar of English. It must know the syntax, right? And more than that, it actually knows something about the world. You know, maybe this is not what I would write, but this is, you know, perfectly uh, plausible, right? And then you might say, well, but he read so much stuff online. It's just kind of replicating things that, it, that it's already seen. But that's actually not, not exactly what's going on. Here, I type something else that, uh, it would be, uh, you know, it would require more than just memorization. What's scary about this is that in order to predict what words are going to come up next, the model actually learned how to do basic math. Now, remember, all I told the model to learn was what word comes next. I didn't say anything about math, about the existence of numbers, but the, uh, the model just decided, well, you know, to, uh, to figure out that it's going to be $5, I need to, you know, I need to work this out. And then he knows, of course, all kinds of things that, it, that he read online, right? And you can ask about 
you know, just arbitrary things, anything you, you, you want, you can, uh, you can ask and then, you know, you can refer to things and, uh, and it does, you know, a pretty decent job for a lot of things. It gets a lot of stuff wrong too, but it's a model that knows a lot of stuff. There's a whole lot that it doesn't know, but it's surprising, at least to me, it's so exciting that uh, if you just say, if you just say, learn to predict the next word, what the model ends up learning is a whole lot about the world, right? And, uh, and then there's, I don't even know if I should show this next slide because it will give you some ideas, but you could do this with one of these models. Remember the things in bold face here is what I typed and then the model completed it, right? A lot of people, you know, like spend so much time uh, trying to figure out uh, how to write their statement of purpose. If you just write a little header, say it's like complete the statement of purpose, the model will go and write it for you. And the, the cool thing about it is that if I, I can keep generating these and it generate, generates randomly. So each time I generate this will be a different one and they will all look more or less like this. It's, it's you know, it's, uh, it's fun stuff. You might still be thinking, yeah, but it's still probably just copying stuff that uh, that is sought before. It's just kind of repeating things that already exist. And then I said, you know, how can I show that it's just creating stuff that it's not just copying stuff, right? So I decided to say, actress Julia Roberts became first female president of Mexico. Now complete this uh, news bit here. And then sure, sure enough, it, uh, it wrote a plausible story. <laughs> about Julia Robertson becoming the, the president of Mexico with quotes and, and, and everything. So that's the neural language model, right? The thing that looks like this, you can do it in English, you can use text in any language you want to create uh, models in different languages. Now what I want to talk about really is not just models in different languages, but one model with lots of languages uh, in it. Another exciting piece of this that, uh, that makes this all work is that people discovered early on with these models that there is a way to do translation. And it works like this. It's so simple to do translation with these models. It works like this. You just train the model with, you know, you say a sentence in English, and then you, right after that, you say the same sentence in whatever it is, Japanese. And when you say, keep predicting the next word, after you see some words in English, start, it's going to start predicting Japanese because that's what it saw when, you were, when it was learning to predict the next word. So with translation, it would look something like this. You would say, oh, this is English. And uh, here are some words in English. And then, after some time, after some word, you say, okay, now this is gonna be Portuguese. And then you look at what it predicts and you will start predicting the uh, Portuguese words that will be the translation for this. Then a uh, very bright uh, cognitive science undergrad that I had uh, a few years ago said, okay, let's do something else with this translation machinery. Let's just scramble uh, some sentences and have the model translate scrambled sentences, randomly scrambled sentences into sentences in the correct order. Okay, so I'm translating from the language of scrambled stuff. I just randomly rearranged the words into words in the original order in English. So keep this in mind. It's just a translation machine that works with this neural language model that will just reorder words. It will translate into some made up language that has random word order into the actual word order, right? You can do this for English, works pretty well. The model learns to, to order things in English correctly. And then there's one more twist that makes this uh, even more uh, exciting to me. And it's that if you train these models, with different languages. Remember, you get these uh, magical arrangements of words, right? 
all the English words are arranged magically in a way that's meaningful, it represents the world. If you do it in Japanese, it will do the same thing. If you do it in Portuguese, if you do it in any language, it will do the same thing. And then the amazing thing is that the space that it learns where all these words go is actually the same space. The first time I realized that they were the same, it was in 2018, somebody published this paper that uh, they showed that they were the same. My mind was blown. I was like, wow, it's the same. And then I thought about it. It's like, why is it the same? The relationships between these concepts, relationships between student and teacher, student and university, university and city, the geometric relationship, the spatial relationships, they will be about the same in every language, right? Because we're talking about the same things. So these spaces that actually just end up being like rotations of each other and you can you know, just put them in the right place and align them all uh, and make all of these words in different languages align to each other. It's, uh, it's mind boggling stuff. And then I'm not gonna talk about this next bit because it would take too long but my, the, the same student that I was talking about, the cognitive science student, he wrote another honors thesis. So this was his honors thesis. He wrote another one. That's right, he wrote two. And this other one showed that these spaces also correlate with brain signals. When you think of these, when you're reading these words, there's a correlation between these uh, representations and actual signals from the brain. I'm not gonna talk about that piece, but it's also, it's also amazing stuff. So now the multilingual bit, right? Now, instead of just rearranging the words in English, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna add, in, a, in addition to the word, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna add a little extra thing here that says that this is English. And then I'm not gonna skip, I'm not just going to give it English sentences. I'm going to give it English sentences and Japanese sentences and German and Mandarin and uh, Slovene. I'm going to give it all kinds of languages that I can give, get my hands on. And it will do the same thing. It will unscramble all of these languages at the same time, except that when it sees you know, Portuguese sentences, it will have this little thing that says it's Portuguese. When it says it's Japanese, you have this little thing that says it's Japanese. So before, what I said was in learning how to predict the next word, what you end up getting here is that space that puts all the words in the right relationship to the other words, right? And what about here now? What does it learn here? Now, I remember when, uh, when Tai Chi and Dion were running these experiments and they showed me the picture that I'm about to show you. They, they ran the experiment and they said, and I said, okay, they got, you know, the numbers that go, that go here for all the languages. And I say, okay, now plot this in two dimensions and show me the picture. And this was the picture they showed me. I was so excited because what the model learns is the spatial relationship between languages. You learned that there is such a thing as the Romance languages and they are all together over here. And there are Germanic languages and you put them over here and there are Slavic languages and you put them here. So just by being shown text in different languages, just character after character after character, right? The model learned to represent languages, learn what languages are related to each other. It learns these representations from text alone. The, uh, you know, the, these representations tell us about you know, known language relationships and then we said, you know, what kind of information really is in these, uh, in these uh, language representations? What is really captured in this? And remember, these are just numbers, right? So what is, you know, when I say the representation right here, this is just numbers. This is like, you know, Japanese will be like a 0 0.5, 1 1.2, and, you know, 3.7, and so on. You just want some vector like this, some, uh, some numbers. And then we decided to dig a little deeper into this and see what do these numbers actually represent. There's something called the uh, World Atlas of Language Structures, and it includes a whole lot of languages. And for each language, 
you will have several facts about that language. For example, does the language have a definite article? English does, right? It's the, uh, and uh, Japanese doesn't have a definite article. Uh, does the language have gender and personal pronouns? Does the language have different pronouns for different levels of politeness? Does the language have different verb forms for, for past and future? Does the language put the subject before the verb or after the verb? What about the object before or after? What about the adjective before or after? So for all kinds of languages, this world atlas of language structures of walls has those, that information for all these languages. And here's what we did. We created a little feed forward network. It's something that looks like this, where here we put that representation that the language model learned for that language. So I say, I put, you know, the numbers for, uh, for Japanese here. And then I, you know, just like before, these are all connections and th these are all going to add up. And does it add up to this or this being greater? Adjective before noun or adjective after noun? So now I'm making predictions about languages given just those language representations. I'm not showing it any text anymore. I'm just showing you it like those, it's 50 numbers that represent that language. And here is how well it predicts these facts about languages, right? So I did this with 29 languages. Each time um, I didn't show it one language and I showed, him, I showed the model the rest and then I say predict the facts for this one language a language that it's never seen before. And if you do this, for things having to do with syntax, word order and so on, it gets these things around 85, 90% correct. So it did learn a whole lot about the grammar of, uh, of these languages just in these little vectors, right? And then to, just to see how easy this is, I also try to predict things about the sounds of these languages. There's no way the network could know about the sounds. So if it doesn't know about the sounds and it gets 72%, you might say, how, how is it getting you know, better than 50% if these are like you know, binary choices? Well, some things are just more common than others. So just learn that some things are more common than others. So if in the absence of you know, actual signal, actual information, it could do about maybe 70%. So the fact that it's doing 85 to 90, showing that it's actually learning the, uh, the grammar for these things and encoding the whole grammar into like you know, this little uh, set of numbers. And then I'm just gonna show you one last thing. And then I wanted to see how good these machines can be at actually drawing these little diagrams that represent syntactic structure that we, uh, that we talked about before. Uh, if you have these in different languages, like, like we talked about, you know, the order of the words will be different, right? So how do we predict you know, these diagrams? Well, it's just another neural network. So this is, this is you know, I'll kind of just zip through. If you have questions, you can ask me later, but just in the interest of time, I'll just show you really briefly. It's just another one of these uh, language models. And then I chop off the top because I'm not interested in predicting words now. I'm interested in, is there a little arrow going from one of these words to the other? Because remember, the, these diagrams are all about these arrows, right? So the predictions that I'm making now are, I changed the network a little bit to, to ask, is there an arrow? between these two words? If so, give me a high number right here. What about between these two words? If there is one, give me a high number right here. And I do this for every pair of words, right? So if I were to do this, you know, showing it lots of examples in English and then ask it to predict these diagrams for English, it actually does a very good job it would get 85 to 90% of these arrows correct, which is, you know, I don't know, better than a lot of uh, linguistics uh, students. So, uh, so, so not so bad. Uh, 
But what about doing this with, uh, with more languages, right? So here's, uh, so here's the twist. Uh, we have these diagrams for about 80 languages. That's less than 2% of the world's languages, depending on how you count, maybe about 1% of the languages of the world. So we can have accurate models for these diagrams for about 80 languages. But if we know the grammar of these 80 languages, and we know from our language representations how the languages differ from each other systematically, then can we figure out the syntax for languages that we've never seen before? This is an instance of what you know, NLP people are calling zero-shot learning. Can you learn how to do something without ever being shown what it is that you're supposed to do? So if you have kind of this like standard thing where you just have what's called supervised learning, if you want to learn Spanish sentence diagrams, look at many Spanish sentence diagrams. If you don't have Spanish sentence diagrams, you can do what's called unsupervised learning. If you want to learn the Spanish sentence diagrams, just look at Spanish text, no diagrams. And then from the text, try to figure out what the diagrams are supposed to look like. That's really hard. And here is zero shot learning, what we try to do. To learn the sentence diagrams in Spanish, we're going to look at diagrams for sentences in English, Japanese, German, Italian, and so on, but not Spanish. Okay. So instead of learning the grammar for one language, uh, looking at that one language, we're going to learn the grammar for one language, looking at lots of other languages at once, right? So now in that little network, instead of just having the words, again, I have the, net, the word and what language that comes from. So I tried to learn this using these uh, 16 languages. And here's what happens, right? So if you have data for that language. If you're trying to learn Czech, looking at Czech sentence structure, if you're essentially trying to reproduce what you already have, this is how well you do, right? Sometimes close to 90%, you know, between you know, mid 70s to 90%. If you don't have anything, you're trying to do from text alone, then you have these lower bars here. So now if you have, you know, the zero shot condition where you have other languages, but not the one you're interested in. You can do this well, which is not as good as having permission for that language, but still pretty good. So what is, what is this saying? What it's saying is that when you learn many languages at once, you're not actually just learning those languages that you saw. You are learning how the grammar works for languages in general. And then once you're given that little bit of information, that vector that represents a language, you're in real time adapting that grammar for that new language that you have never seen before. And this you know, is so amazing for so many reasons, right? This can help us study uh, languages where we don't have a lot of resources. And it can allow us, allow us to do a translation for languages that you know, we couldn't translate uh, before by machine, right? We can now understand machines will be able to do what's called language understanding uh, in uh, languages where you know, there were no models for language understanding before. And this has so many practical applications. Now, when I say understanding here, there's been a lot of debate in computational linguistics and NLP lately about whether these models really understand language and what it means to understand language in the first place. These models are never shown what the world is actually like. They have no intent. So can there be understanding without intent? So there's a lot of these uh, discussions going on at what is the nature of understanding and what, what, how can we characterize? These models clearly are doing something. What is it understanding? How does it differ from what, you know, what we do and how we see uh, language, right? And then there's other you know, really uh, tricky uh, issues that people are dealing with. These models already know so much, right? I remember when uh, one of these models was released, you know, this uh, you know, lab called uh, OpenAI created one of these models. It was not the one I showed. It was one that was much worse than that. Uh, the, uh, they said, we created this wonderful model. We are not gonna make it public 
because we don't know if that's the right thing to do. We have no idea what will happen when, once we put this thing out in the world. And people laughed and it's like, oh, that's so ridiculous. What do you think is going to happen? But it turns out that there are really a serious issues that one needs to consider, right? I mean, the simplest of all being something like, if you have a machine that knows all kinds of stuff, and I'm not saying that we do now, but very soon in the future, right? We have a machine that has all of the knowledge accumulated by humankind, right? You can just type and the machine will answer the questions. But the machine speaks English. So everybody who speaks English, you're in luck. If your native language happens to be something else, well, uh, wait until somebody develops it for that language, right? So people in the English speaking world has a huge advantage to have access to the Oracle machine, right? The machine that knows everything. And then there are other much worse things that we can think about. Uh, why is this not what's driving your, your Alexa device or Siri? Well, this is much smarter than what's driving those devices, but this costs a lot of energy to run. As we run these more, we are warming the planet at a rate that's uh, scary to, uh, to think about. And, uh, and we are doing more and more of this. Plus, these things are trained with our text, with stuff that you saw on the web. And stuff that you, that you see on the web, there's a lot of information there. And there's a lot of bad stuff out there too. These models, they know a lot of bad stuff and they say horrendous uh, stuff very frequently. Uh, there's no way Amazon can, you know, start driving your Alexa device with one of these things because all of a sudden it's going to, it's going to start to say things that are really objectionable. Now, it doesn't say objectionable stuff all the time, but it will do it. And that's one of the reasons I didn't actually run these things in real time. I was, it's actually really exciting to, like, type these things in real time and see what the model types. But I, I won't do it because uh, you never know when you're going to get something that's, that's really offensive. And these, these things do come up. Uh, and even when it's not just something offensive, these models are full of the biases that appear in the text that we wrote, right? We cannot expect these models to be better than we are, right? I mean, it's text that we generated. So the models are, uh, you know, predictably uh, biased and prejudiced in all kinds of ways that people who write things on the internet are. So, so much to, to think about here and so much uh, excitement, so much promise, and so much, uh, you know, um, so many issues to, to consider, uh, balance, you know, the, uh, the opportunities and the, uh, with, you know, also the, the challenges that come with, with these things. All right. Uh, I don't want to, I don't want to make this too long. I could talk about language models for, for hours, but, uh, but we're about like, you know, reaching uh, the limit of where we should take things today. So just to conclude here, uh, we talked about neural language models. Uh, we saw that these neural language models can learn representations that capture the grammar of languages. They capture the relationship, the relationships between uh, languages and these uh, mathematical representations of, uh, of languages, right? These vectors that correspond to what languages are in relation to each other. Uh, these, uh, these representations can be used in many ways, right? We showed that we can uh, actually now uh, draw sentence diagrams for sentences that we've never, for languages that we've never seen before, just by learning some general grammar and then making it specific to a language by giving it that language representation. And we've also shown that in work that I didn't talk about here because, you know, I don't, I don't want to keep you for too long, that uh, you can actually use those representations to do language understanding in different languages too. One of the things that I'm working on now is uh, modeling how children learn language. I've used these neural language models to model how children learn English in the United States. And I know how to do this for English. I know how to do this for Spanish because I have the data for English and Spanish. But now I'm applying these language representations to model how children will learn uh, different languages right, just by giving it the recipe for how children learn English in the United States, how children learn Spanish in Mexico, how children learn Japanese in Japan. Now, if I want to say how children learn French in, in France, I get a lot of uh, French uh, text, I get the, the, the representation, and I'll see if the model 
actually figures out how children learn French. So that's the kind of uh, research that I'm doing now. Uh, I'm gonna stop here. Uh, I wanna thank you for uh, sitting through this and remind you that this is you know, joint work with my students, including a cognitive science undergrad, right? Who is uh, now in grad school. Uh, and, uh, and also acknowledge our, our funders. This work was partly funded by Microsoft and, and the NSF. Thanks. Wow, what a great thought provoking talk. That was amazing, Kenji. Uh, thank you for, uh, I've learned so much. Um, what, I, it, was, it was great. I, I'd like to open it up. I think we have, we, we probably have, we have a time for, to entertain some questions or some comments. I was gonna do breakout rooms, but I, I think uh, between the chat and, and perhaps um, uh, just raising your hand. Um, um, I'll try to moderate a little bit or Kenji call on people as well. If people have questions ab uh, about this or comments, it's super interesting, you know, questions ranging from kind of ethics to uh, implementation to computation, just fabulous, fabulous work. Thanks. I just wanted to say I thought that was superb. Um, the the way that um, the way that that talk tied together so many different bits and pieces of uh, cognitive science. There was so much talk in the chat about people saying, "Oh yeah, we did this in this class," and this reminds me. This reminds me of philosophy thirteen G, or this reminds me of this linguistics class. This reminds me of something else. It was just really super the way that it brought together so many of the different things that we've looked at in various classes. Yeah, thanks. That's, uh, you know, cognitive science. <laughs> That's, no, this is like a model for basically, yeah, this is why we do cognitive science. This is why we bring all these disciplines together. Um, I was going to say, I noticed um, Stace had a question about backpropagation in the chat window. Stace, if you wanted to ask that now. Yeah, I was just wondering if uh, these models use backpropagation. I don't know if that's to, you know, have the model uh, get better, if that's just part of the unsupervised process. Uh, I was wondering if you could talk about that. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, and yes, these uh, neural networks are trained with, uh, with backpropagation. Uh, remember what I was talking about, you know, this very simple thing. Uh, and I was saying, uh, you know, when you see uh, the word on and you want the model to get the word the, but it gets something else instead. It, you know, it said uh, you know on, and then it gets uh, you know walks, right? And you say, oh, it was not walks. It was it was the. And then I said that then you adjust all of these weights, right? All the way from the, you know, going back all the way to the word on, and you make it so that next time you see the word on, you're more likely to see the. Yeah, that's done through uh, back propagation. And, uh, you know, and uh, these other models, they're trained with backpropagation too. Uh, when, uh, when you get some prediction here and it's not right, you're gonna backpropagate not just here, but you backpropagate through, uh, you know, like through time, like going, going back. So that's, uh, that's, you know, kind of a little bit of how these uh, models learn. It is through, uh, through backpropagation. And again, these models, like you know, a model like this, like I said, this is like a you know simplified uh, version of uh, you know neural language models, right? And uh, the the ones that uh, that I showed were models that you know a little more involved in this, but this gives you kind of an idea of how these things could work. And uh, and these things have been around for I mean, models that are like this uh, have been around for for a long, long time, right? And, uh, and it's been uh, in the past few years that they've become more, you know, more popular again, and everybody's using them, you know, including me, like you saw in the, uh, the work with multilingual stuff. But yes, backpropagation, definitely a, a part of how these models learn. Any other questions or comments for Kenji? Yeah, there's a hand up. Uh, yes. Dylan, go ahead. Yeah, so I was wondering, um, as these models become more and more complicated, um, 
do you see it becoming progressively more difficult to anticipate um, or predict how their predictions are going to turn out? And like, if you give like a general sense of degree is how more difficult, if so? Yeah, uh, that's, that's a great question. Uh, one of the ways to look at, at it is that if the model were really terrible, it would be really hard to predict what they would do, right? Because it would be not what we expect and not what we want. Uh, the more, you know, so if the model learns English pretty well, it's actually a little easier to predict what they're going to do because it's going to be, it's going to look like reasonable English. But at the same time, you know, as you get more and more of these connections, one of the challenges that we have now is interpreting what the model learned, right? So why is it making the decisions that it's, uh, that it's making? And it's really important for us to know this because these models are already being used in all kinds of practical situations. And we would like to have some degree of explainability, right? Why did the model do this? And then, you know, understanding how the model makes decisions would also help us understand, you know, the model's uh, blind spots and weak spots and when it's going to do something bad, right? It would help, uh, help us understand why bad things happen. And, uh, and it is right now an active area of research. A lot of people are looking into uh, interpretability of these models. And, uh, and one of the things that's uh, fascinating is that, uh, you know, the types of experiments that we used to do with, you know, human subjects, you know, look at this, you know, you know tell me what you think or choose one of these things to, to understand how people process language. We're starting to do the same things with these models because we taught them, you know, we know what we taught them to do, predict the next word. Or in some models, it's, you know, I hide one word and pre predict the word that I'm hiding now. Uh, we know what we taught them to do, but the model, you know, learned a whole, you know, set of things to be able to do that task. And we want to figure out exactly what it's doing. So now uh, there is a, you know, a number of things we're doing to, uh, to you know, towards uh, interpreting uh, what the models actually learn and why they say the things they say and so on. I saw that somebody had a, uh, a really a question about a, a personality in the uh, in the chat if you uh, if you see you know some personality coming through in the uh, in the in the writing that may not be necessarily the personality of the model right depending on how i write the prompt the model will continue writing you know in a way that's consistent with that context that i gave it right so one of the things that people like to do for fun with these models is to, uh, you know, have the model pretend to be different historical figures. Uh, you just, you know, type a little bit of what the historical figure is. If somebody wants to, uh, you know, have a conversation with whoever it is, like President Lincoln or something, you can make the model, you know, play that part. Uh, it's not that the model has that personality, but you can make the model act in that way by giving it the right uh, context. Actually, when uh, I started looking at it, these, uh, uh, these models, one of the things that I proposed to do was to uh, figure out if you could determine if there is, you know, like I said, you can make the model behave in many different ways by trying to do it. But I wanted to try to see, and this I end up not doing, it, but, uh, but I, I still want to do it, try to see if there is something that's closer to like some, you know, some dominant personality or some default, what the model most wants to be like. There are questionnaires that, uh, that people use uh, to find out these things in people, like people in different cultures, what do they care more about? There's this thing called the moral foundations questionnaire. Do people care more about this or that? And I wanted to see what, what these language models care about. If we ask those questions to a language model, uh, you know, can we find out what the models you know, care about? Not that they care about something in the way that we care about them, right? But, uh, but in the writing, what would show up? But that's also a, a fascinating uh, question. Yeah. Uh, Ed, Alfonso, go, go ahead, ask your question. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, I, I've just been thinking a lot about, there was a slide where you showed a graph that showed 
uh, kind of like the, the spatial relationship between languages. And mm. since that, I haven't been able to stop thinking about uh, what about make, yeah, exactly that one. How about having a, um, <laughs> how about having a like graphic representation of each language? So each word uh, kind of like is a vector and then you can see the relationship between words uh, where you could have, oh, king is connected to uh, man, boy, and then, you know, you see the connection between words. Uh, I'm just thinking it'd be really interesting uh, if we could see kind of like a like spatial representation of languages. And it seems yeah. like with, with all this, it could be very possible. Yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, it is. And uh, in fact, I mean, that, uh, that work that I mentioned that uh, where somebody figured out that you could align the, uh, the words in these spaces. If you, uh, you know, get a word for whatever it is like computer in, uh, in English, and you say, show me the closest point that is, you know, a Japanese word to this word computer. It would be the Japanese word for computer. If I say, uh, show me the, you know, the closest point in like, that is a, a, a you know, a Mandarin word, it would be the Mandarin word for, for a computer. And uh, people have, uh, you know, uh, done uh, kind of, you know, kind of word translation that way, just like putting all the words in one uh, in one space when you have a giant space with all the you know words for the different languages in it it is uh, and then you can also try to compute like the relationships between these things and you know play like geometric uh, tricks involving uh, multiple uh, multiple languages it is a uh, uh, fun stuff you mean do you mean for example saying oh um i don't know leg plus uh body like yeah, equals yeah. oh wow that's incredible yeah you can actually do you know like math that, and it, it it actually makes sense in terms of the words yeah that's incredible thank you um Kenji, if I might just uh, ask a quick question. I'm, so it's, it's interesting to think about the input to this model, which is all written language, which tends to be very you know, well composed and so forth. I'm curious about what you think, you know, what human language is like normally in, in terms of performance where we have our false starts and stops and restarts and so forth. What do you predict the, 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 a, a language model like that would, would do if it had true spoken language input with all of the performance characteristics of human speech rather than this, this well uh, composed uh, sentential information? Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a great question, right? I mean, uh, what, what will happen when we start building these models? You know, not from text, but just from audio. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, you know, will it, uh, what's gonna happen? I mean, I, I think that we are not too far from uh, from doing things like that. I mean, there's already some work uh, doing something like this, but we don't have, uh, you know, nearly the the same amount of uh, of data, or you know, in the uh, audio form. And uh, and then there's you know, it's not just the uh, it's not just that spontaneous language will look different, right? There is you know all you know different kinds of, uh, of issues that you know voices are different and you know how do you segment things and how are you going to figure out like what the right you know unit for segmenting things is going to be so uh, my my sense is that uh, these are problems that you know people are thinking about and we'll figure this out we're going to have the models that are analogous to this but with spoken language uh, soon enough uh, and with that, we're going to have even more, you know, thorny issues to think about. We are already at the point where you can uh, create fake voices, right? You can, you know, get enough recordings from one person and you can create the voice of that person. Now you couple that with uh, getting enough, you know, 
enough samples of things that the person said in terms of the, uh, you know, the writing or uh, transcriptions. And now you can get that person saying anything in that person's voice just by using uh, these, uh, these language models. And uh, just like it created, you know, a little uh, blurb about Julie Roberts becoming uh, the president of Mexico, the potential for, uh, for you know, you know, fake news, misinformation and disinformation with this. If you want a fake news farm, if you want some, you know, some uh, disinformation bots on social media, uh, yeah, you can unleash them. And when it's written, it's one thing, you know, people are still convinced by things that are, you know, obviously false when they, when they read it, but there, it's a whole different level. When you hear a trusted voice, saying those words, even if you know this might be fake, just hearing those words coming from that person, feeling you know, that familiarity, it's a, it's a whole new level of, uh, of scariness. Uh, of course, there's a, another side to this, right? Uh, like many years ago, I worked on a, uh, uh, I, I worked at, a, at an institute that was, uh, you know, trying to combine a lot of different uh, advances in graphics and, uh, and language processing to create immersive experiences. And one of the projects uh, that, uh, that they had at that institute was uh, a way to preserve uh, the memories of Holocaust survivors. So you would get the, uh, the video and the, uh, and the text and the, uh, and the audio, and then try to recreate for, this was, was to be the play at a museum to museum visitors, the experience of interacting face to face with the Holocaust survivors. So long after the people can no longer, you know, you know, tell their stories, people can still get that experience. So there is, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of opportunity there with these uh, models as they become more human-like. But like I said, also a, a whole world of uh, trouble that comes with these things. Thank you very much. A couple more questions in the chat, I think. Okay, let's see. Um, somebody asked about research to trace the evolution of the embedding spaces uh, through time. Um, does that mean uh, how language changes over time, right? And you can, uh, you can see uh, the, uh, the word usage over time. Uh, there, there is, there is a fascinating work. Um, one of one, I mean, there are a lot of these uh, 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 studies about how things have changed over time. A pretty well known one uh, is from uh, Dan Jurafsky and colleagues. It appeared in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, uh, where they look at uh, bias in language over time by getting a text from different periods in time, you can see how word usage, and especially uh, you know, reflecting uh, different types of biases, gender bias and racial bias, how those things changed over time through these uh, embedding spaces. It's, uh, it's fascinating work. Uh, but you know, there are many, uh, many people have, have looked at these, at these issues. It's, uh, it's a, a great question. Uh, and somebody asked about animal sounds to uh, try to recognize uh, non-human language. Yeah, uh, I haven't seen anything uh, on uh, on you know animal sounds, but conceivably, you know, some so so some animals have some limited form of uh, communication that involves sounds, right? It's not the same as uh, as human languages, but uh, yeah, I mean, I see no reason why. Uh, you wouldn't be able to to model uh, things that are not a, you know human language, but but I'm not familiar with uh, with any work that tries to do that. Yeah, somebody says in the chat there is you know there's a group trying to do that. Excellent. Well, that was just a really, again, fascinating, super, super, uh, super interesting talk. And I'd just like to thank all of you cognitive science majors for coming out and, and listening to Kenji and engaging in this community that we, uh, this rich community that we have uh, at UC Davis. 
And I really look forward to more of these opportunities. Uh, so please uh, thank you all for attending uh, and, and stay tuned for uh, more exciting news from uh, the Cognitive Science Program here at UC Davis. And good luck this quarter uh, with your classes and all. Yeah, thanks. thanks everybody for joining in. That was awesome talk from Kenji. Thank you today for organizing this and all the faculty and particularly our yellow cluster uh, yes. advisors for joining us. Um, they're really the people who keep this going. Um, so yeah, uh, thank you so much. I miss all my COGSI students and the faculty. I miss seeing you all in person. It's really, it's so nice to see you all this evening, even if it's just virtually, but I really hope we get back to in-person teaching soon. Right on. And yeah, I really look forward to hearing about the development of the Cognitive Science Club. That's going to be great. People sign up and yeah, for more news. And yeah, that's going to be awesome.